Reports from Portland. I guess I don't need to make this linear. Uh, reports from Portland. Since I left New York, I've um, been meaning to give like a recap of what I've been doing. I've been taking lots of pictures and I've been meant to posting them, but I've just not been in the mood for egoing, which is a problem I've had for the last year. Um, but even probably the last four or five years, I've just not been enjoying egoing as much as I did before. I was like, it's so fun to tell you about what I'm doing. And then I was like, I don't, I don't really want to do that anymore which is weird because there's still an impulse but it's not as joyful or something I left New York and typical for me when I'm leaving this is odd because I'm such a seasoned traveler but I still have this crazy thing that happens that when I'm getting ready to leave for any significant amount of time I don't sleep I have all these things that I want to do I get done and I wanted to clean my apartment because you know some people are going to be staying there while I'm away and, and I, don't, I didn't want it to be filthy and I kind of live in a disorganized way and so I stayed up all night um, and uh, reformatted my phone because it had been malfunctioning and I didn't even say that restored the phone um, so I arrived in a really sleep deprived and uh, discompopulated way and I guess a couple days before I left I also found out my friend Robert died and the weird thing about this is I'm preparing for this trip to be a Mercury retrograde chip. Mercury retrograde hasn't started yet it goes retrograde on the 12th today I think is the 10th so still two more days before Mercury actually stationary and then goes to retrograde which probably doesn't mean a lot to a lot of you people but it does to me I'm got a lot of mercury in myself and I've been studying astrology for a long time um, mercury retrograde is a good time to deal with things from the past so I was looking at this trip being like oh it's nice I'm gonna be there not during mercury retrograde and then mercury's gonna go retrograde and I'll you know dealing with the past from the present and then into the past um, but what's been nice about this trip was I it's been so long since I've been in Portland maybe 10 years maybe nine I don't remember nine years ten years it's been so long since I've been here that I'm not I'm, I, I've lost all of connection to the city. I'm not friends with anybody any here, here anymore. Um, I mean, like, close. I don't keep in touch with anybody from here anymore. And um, the last few times I came here, I kept being like, this isn't the city I lived in. I don't like this anymore. Uh, I don't like how it's changed. And now I'm not doing that. I'm just seeing it how it is. And staying in a condo downtown is so different than where I, I used to live and how I used to live in Portland that uh, it's just a different city. And I sit on the balcony. I can sit naked on the balcony and let the sun hit me in the morning and meditate and look out and meditate and look out and make time-lapse videos. Um, and it's just a very different way of being in the city. And, uh, you know, last night I was able to look out at the city and be like, in, I don't know, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, this is all going to look like New York. It's all going to be gigantic glass towers because that's just the way things are going. If they go. If they persist. Flying in, seeing all the mountains, seeing the river gorge. Uh, see, it's, it was so beautiful. And the first morning I woke up here, I slept out on the balcony. I woke up and I could see Mount Hood in the distance. Pretty much since then, there's been forest fires that have filled up the Willamette Valley with smoke. So I haven't been able to see anything. And the throat's a little sore. And a lot of people have had allergies and gummy eyes. And But yes, I've had days in the city and days out of the city meeting people. Um, and being pretty adamant about like oh, I don't want to just hook up so but there have been um, obviously some sexual forays and interesting connections with people um, in relationship not in relationship and questioning like what do I want out of these people what am I trying to get out of these relationships what am I trying to do and part of me you know I had to admit well part of the reason I'm here is like maybe I want to live here again um, and I'm not going to like say there's a verdict on that, but I, I kind of decided before I even came out here, even though that was my initial uh, impetus for coming out here, was maybe I'd want to live in Portland again. Let's check out and see how it feels. I even think even before I came out here, I was like, I don't want to live in a city again for a while. I think I'd like to do something else, do something else for a while. Um, and like I like the idea of living in the country, either on a farm or a commune or something that's not so commerce based and something that's not so entertainment based um, and something that's more community based. So that's the so that's even before I came out here, I was like, I don't know if Portland is actually a good idea, but still, I like the idea of just spending time here and like, what does the community feel like here? And I haven't felt like a community yet. I wanted community. 
I didn't want to pay the price for it. I have a regular thing of just feeling like an outsider, so that's mostly how I felt. Um, progressive days of loneliness the longer I've been here, um, of just like connecting with people, some people I knew from New York who live here now, and, um, and just people I'd met here 10 years ago, and new people. Yeah, so I've been connecting with new people and old people. There's actually a person I met in Indiana um, who I thought was very sexy. And he really wanted to hook up with me again. And I was like, I do think you're very sexy, but I don't, I don't really just want to hook up with people. That's something I'm, I'm pretty adamant about. Um, so, of course, then the opposite of that is that most of the people I have been having sex with, I've been doing it like in full-on bore love mode, which um, isn't really good for my heart. Um, or work mode, which is weird. You know, people just hiring me to spend time with me. And I'm like, ah. Um, which is it's just, that's not what I regularly do. So it's been very interesting to be like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's right. This is, this is a, the way of, yeah, I don't like hooking up anymore. It doesn't have value to me. So I think of this thing Alan Watts said, that if you love anything and you do what you love, then you become good at it enough that people will pay you for it. And I'm like, I put so much value on sex when I was younger, really thinking that it was a healing modality that could, like, save the world. Which I no longer really feel. <laughs> and uh, and yet I'm really good at it because I put a lot of effort into it. And so on certain levels I get paid for it. Like that skill of being present and caring. And um, that's just been interesting to transition into um as a more direct way because i've always done uh tangential sex work and, and healing work but it's very different to just be like oh, okay i'm a sex object it's cool you feel good It'll make you feel good i mean literally like the two clients that i had here on that level were just like thank you for the ecstasy not drugs just experience um so that's been interesting to feel that. And uh, I saw some friends of mine yesterday from Indiana, kids I knew, one of them from the age of two and one of them from the age of, I think, 12 or 13, who I really loved and had like super intimate relationship with when I was a teenager. And uh, various falling outs with them over the years until we just broke apart and we haven't talked in years. Um, and I certainly haven't seen them in, like nine years or something. And so it was interesting to see them again, and I felt terrified. I noticed how terrified I felt, like I was going on an audition or I was being judged or something um, before they showed up. And when they showed up, I was, like, looking at my phone and editing photos, and I literally, like, jumped and threw the phone. <laughs> I was like, ah! I was so terrified when I heard their voice. Um, and it was interesting to, like, feel the little judgments I made, but also the familiarities Specifically, my female friend, the way she spoke just reminded me of like all the ways she spoke when we were friends. The little things she says and does with her words that were so familiar and just brought up so much love and friendliness and like immediate intimacy. But we don't, we're not friends anymore. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately, like what makes someone a friend? Uh, one of the guys here I've been spending time with who's married... Um, to a man uh, and has been for 13 years or something and he's a really great guy and he's really handsome and sexy and 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 came correct and in that he like asked me a lot of like our first meeting was lunch oh, when a lot of like interesting interviews I really wished I would have recorded it um, but I was just you know being a person with him I would have recorded it for this project it would have been perfect um, but you know the last time I saw him um, we and he, he's like well, I don't know if I'll be able to see you again before you go he said, but I would just, you know, I would. I hope we can be friends. And I was like, what does it mean to be friends with someone? I don't do friends across the country. I don't do that. A friend is someone you hang out with. A friend is someone you, I mean, I, I did do that with Leo. Leo and I would talk at least once a week for an hour. So that was a friend across the country. But I had this like long, and I used to do friends over long distance, but I just don't like doing that. I don't even know if I, I'm good at being friends with anyone at this point. So it was interesting to be like, I've thought about ex-lovers, especially like this friend who, this one who died. I'm like, we weren't friends when he died. Um, he would never call me. Um, and I think of 
this other guy I dated a couple years ago, and I just keep thinking, like, we're not friends. I don't know if we ever were friends. We had an infatuation and a physical relationship, and I don't know what we were trying to do, but it didn't work for me or him, and um, I don't think we were friends, and we're certainly not friends now. Um, so it's interesting to see my old friends and just look at them and take them in and hear their stories and be like, well, we're not friends. And when the evening ended, they were like, well, we got to walk home. There was just, it was just like this very like, okay, well, this little foray is over. We're not friends. Go on to your life. Go walk back to your bike through these dark, unfamiliar streets, (laughs) your borrowed bike and uh, bike on home or your borrowed home. I don't know. I felt silly, super silly, lonely last night but got back in time to record the moon rising. There's so much haze and pollution here that even after the moon rose, it was invisible blackness. And it faded out of the blackness into like this rich blood red that then faded into the bright, still gibbous moon. Not friends. Um... So again, like I've been meditating since I got here, which has been pretty impressive to me in that I have not been meditating very much this year. It's been frustrating to me um, since the, since my birthday. It's been really frustrating and difficult to sit and meditate. And I got so unhappy five days ago. I felt so unhappy that I was like, this is when you sit down to meditate. And they do say that in Buddhism, that, that acute suffering is a, a precursor to faith, feeling lost and lonely and friendless I um, started meditating and just you know sitting and staring out over the city naked on the balcony and letting the eyes close when they felt like it and being in that and uh, doing the heart work the Brahma Viharas and doing the the Vipassana it's been uh, it's been great to meditate at night meditate in the morning um meditate on or contemplate on things but mostly just meditate so I've been meditating regularly and a lot of the things that I just don't do much in my own life like practice foreign language on Duolingo every day Um, I haven't been writing and again I've been making little videos but they haven't been making me happy and I don't know if this video is what I intended to do um It's a little recap, though. It's a version of a recap. It's not exquisite detail. There doesn't need to be. What can I say? I ate lots of berries. I ate lots of berries. I discovered a nice little local organic free-range Mexican place near where I'm staying. I've been drinking a lot of the local kombucha. Even less interesting things than the things I've been blathering on about for the last 20 minutes. Um... But it's been very nice to be naked in nature. It's been very nice to appreciate the mossy forest. It's been very nice to appreciate the waterfalls. I haven't gotten out to the ocean yet. I would really like, would have liked to get to the ocean while I was here. I created a playlist called Simple Life. Because one of the men I met here at the beach was like, oh yeah, Starfucker, I've heard of them. They have this song about Astoria. Because he was going to Astoria. And I was like, that's right. It's a song called, you know, that all the lyrics are just simple life. I want a simple life. I want a simple life. Who wants a simple life? Who wants a simple life? Who doesn't want a simple life? I was thinking of how um, almost 40, it's easier for me to um, let it go. It's more attractive to not get engaged about things. which can be perceived as indifference when you're in your 20s. When you're a teenager and you're in your 20s, it's like painful to not engage, to let it go. And you look at it and you're like, that's why there's all these problems in the world because you're not trying to solve the problems in the world. But when you're in your 40s or even late 30s, you're like, you know, I can't solve the problems in the world, so I'm just going to live with it. (laughs) And I remember when I was in my 20s, I fucking hated that when I would talk to older people because I was always attracted to older people so I'd hear this all the time oh you just have to learn to let that go and I'd be like fuck you what does that even mean let that go and uh, now I'm really feeling it as an adult it's just nicer to not tear your heart up about things 
The ones who made a difference By withstanding indifference I guess it's up to me now Should I take that risk or just smile? Hey, what do you know? It happened again When we left lunch, we went into the restaurant to pee, playing the old game of cruising at the urinal, a little flirting. I was turned on and we kissed till someone came in. We walked arm in arm down the esplanade my heart on poking, deforming my pants, big smiles on our faces or in our hearts or in our bellies, happy at all the people seeing us. My arm was underneath his arm, around his back. He was slightly taller than me a perfect fit. I loved the feeling of his broad body, our hips touching. We walked in sync, like the game of Siamese twins that we tried to play as siblings and could never really get right. He and I were doing naturally. And like many occurrences in the few days I spent with him, when I mentioned it, he said, I was just thinking about that. We kept having to pause to kiss. And when he came over the next day and we spent five hours together, I gave him the disclaimer that I said, I want to be able to say I love you because it feels good and I don't want you to get frightened about it because I understand you're married. Getting high on the heart on. Taking lots of pictures. Something beautiful and mysterious and not mine. Trying to please each other please ourselves. It was nice to cook him lunch. It was nice to go on an adventure and feel caring and make sure he ate. One, two, three, four, five, six meals together in the ten days I was here. We held hands and both remarked repeatedly on how nice it felt to hold hands. After our day together in the forest, I felt angry, sad, lost, confused. Annoyed that I couldn't be simpler, couldn't be attached, couldn't be unattached. Surprised at our last dinner that he said goodbye Oh yeah, we're not going to see each other again. Okay. And that was that. When we walked across the park, there was still light. She pointed out that even though the signs requested all dogs must always be on a leash 
There were three dogs running freely in the field. <clears throat> and we went out through that gate and walked into the next part of the park. A deep depression, noticeably cooler down there. Half a skateboard left in the grass. She rolled a cigarette, pointed out the sap dripping down the side of the tree. We talked like old friends. And it wasn't long, but the evening wore on and they all had to go home. Having no home to go through, I felt adrift and wandered back the way we came. I found a broken golf ball and the broken skateboard. And, I, and actually a broken bottle of some sort some nefarious uses, I'm sure. I made myself useful, collected the trash, put it in the proper receptacle. Back at my bike, there was a boy drinking beers with some friends that I had met naked at Rooster Rock. I did not get his name, but I knew his tattoos. He said hello. After his friends left, I said I wasn't sure what his name was. And when he told it to me, I said that I had seen that on Growler, but wasn't sure if it was his real name. And just as our conversation started to start, his boyfriend called, which he showed me on his iPhone screen. And it was enough to exit. And I biked home, lonely as a cloud. To someone tonight, tonight. I was describing to someone tonight um, the process by which I learned the Buddhist heart training. I was really being careful not to use jargon. So I didn't say Brahma Viharas and I didn't say Metta. <laughs> I was trying to describe samadhi to him and I, you know, I used the word samadhi and I was like, and then you get into these, it doesn't matter what they're called. And I didn't say the word jhana. And Jeanette Anyway, um, I was describing the first retreat I went on last March and the, it was so nice to kind of hear the way I described it was this like, I was being told to do one specific thing, which was hang all of the attention on one object, the movement of the breath at the nostrils. And I was failing miserably and hating myself for it because I was so imperfect and so failing. And in four days of constantly beating myself up, ah, I can't do it, ah, I can't do it, I can't do it. Um, I gave up and I went back to my room and I started reading this book that my friend who had invited me had given me and as a Buddhist primer being nobody going nowhere and um, and I got to the chapter about the Brahma Viharas the meta heart training um, I got the general gist and then applied it for the next four days and just cried and the way I described it to him was you start by looking at yourself and focusing on the good things and listing the good things. 
So it doesn't even matter if you believe them. They're just good things that you can that you pick out in your brain, that pop up in your consciousness. Oh, you have nice eyes. You have a nice voice. You have nice hair. Uh, you're kind. You're considerate. Um, you're uh, caring. Etc. 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 And just by paying attention to the good qualities, the natural response is that the heart opens in kindness and friendliness. And then you wish well for yourself once you start to feel this. And then you go to someone or something easy that just makes your heart open in happiness and joy and uh, kindness and friendliness be it a person or a situation, or an object or a creature. And then you go to some one or thing that's neutral, that you don't really care much about either way, and you practice with that. Again, listing good things, wishing good things, um, goodwill. And then you go to someone difficult, again, listing the good things. Until the heart opens, friendliness, and then wishing goodwill. And then doing it for all beings in existence, all things. And um, I was just meditating out on the balcony naked. And opened my eyes at one point and looked out over the city. And remembered what I was saying earlier which in a video I made earlier today, but also in another conversation I was having with the same person, that I respond to most social interaction, most people, most historical human actions as uh, with sadness and anger that it's either sadness or anger, or both sadness and anger. Uh, so much of it elicits sadness and anger, and it's obvious that, uh, and I've been aware of this in a lot of my relationships, the reason that, that sadness and anger gets elicited from my heart so frequently is because I focus more, I see more of the faults, the dangers, the troubles, the abuse, exploitation. I remember when I was younger and I was trying to figure out how to love and be loved and I was like, you know, everybody's an asshole. Everybody's irritating. Everybody's really fucking annoying. But they're also nice and friendly and interesting and even lovable. So no matter who it is, you can choose to focus on the irritating things or focus on the lovable things. And obviously, if you focus on the lovable things more, then you're going to be happier with them. And although that totally makes sense to me, I had an insight. It was obvious. It's not something I do naturally. It's not something I'm conditioned to do. And so it is also true with all things that I experience in this world. All beings, all history. And I mean, and this came up because he had taken me to see this waterfall, the Willamette Falls, down in Oregon City, that was once Willamette Falls, across from Lynn City. And it's so ugly. It's so fucking polluted and bastardized and destroyed. Commerce and industry, so ugly, so horrible. Beautiful waterfall. Fuck. And of course, all over it, they have the nature of how this was like a sacred spot to the Native Americans who lived here, the Warm Spring Indian tribes who believed that, you know, God, the Wankantanka, had created this so that they would always have something to, to eat all year round. And then the place that the salmon would jump there, they fucking people, they, you know, they, as soon as the white people got there, they put a land claim on it and then started fucking it up. Anger, see? Anger. Anger agitates the heart. Not healthy, not happy.
Why am I conditioned? Mm. Family, conditioned to see fear, conditioned to see fault. So anyway, yeah, while I was meditating tonight, I had the realization that that's what the Buddhist practice is actually about, that not just with self and with people personally, but with all beings throughout all of history to focus on the lovable, focus on the friendly, focus on the kind, let the heart open, give goodwill. So as not to create more suffering I spent some of this evening with a Catholic priest, or an ex-Catholic priest, and I went on and on about my beliefs, about the priesthood and the role in society vis-a-vis -vis shamans and medicine men and witch doctors, priests, where the gays are supposed to be in society, where they don't have to have children. He was angry about the closetedness, because he was a closeted gay priest. Back here at the house, while brushing my teeth, the idea occurred to me that possibly the look that I have, that I've had pretty much since I was 14, well, not so much the great beard that took a while to come in, may have been inspired by Jesus, subconsciously, because I certainly didn't believe in or care about Jesus when I was 14 and first grew my hair out long, but I later found when I started doing acid in the desert that Jesus was deep in my mind behind a lot of the uh, beliefs and motivations and stuff that I had silently waiting for a conversation. So he may have been a culprit in the growing out of the hair, mainly thinking along the lines of power. That um, I was never, I didn't think that I had long hair because I was a metal head. Although I did like Faith No More and Nine Inch Nails, which might also have some kind of Christian references. Um, but I wasn't a huge metal head. I didn't grow my hair out to be a metal head, more to be an alternative something something. But I would make jokes about aristocratic 14th century Louis the 14th. There's some, I don't know, ignorant stuff about aristocracy when they had long hair, the men. Something about elegance. Power, though. That's the important part of this little non-conversation. Whenever I'm with priests, I feel like they want to fuck me because I look like Jesus. Fuck. What a crude word. Have some kind of sex, real intercourse, making love, getting off, whatever, lust, attraction. I feel like it's a Jesus thing. I feel like that with most people that are Christian obsessed or Christian inured, saturated with the Christianity from childhood. Jesus fetish. Latinos too sometimes. Um, But yeah, he was an image of power, lording over everybody, as it were. And it occurs to me I felt so powerless as a teenager, as a child, as a teenager, that perhaps subconsciously I took on this look. 
to give myself an air of power, a position of power. Nothing more to say about that. It's just an idea. Letting the days go by. I was a child. You're always waiting until you can do what you want to do, and then you're always doing what you want to do, and you're constantly doing things, and you want to do more things, and you always want to do more things, and it seems like fucking hours. It seems forever, ever, until you get to do what you want to do. And then you're tired, and you go to sleep, and you wake up, and you want to do more things. When I was young and I was a traveler, the days seemed very long. I just thought of that Smith's line. Life is very long when you're lonely. I guess I was lonely as a traveler. I was in love a lot, though, but just in love with someone somewhere else because I was always moving. Moving. But anyway, days seemed very long. Years seemed very long. Weeks and months seemed very long. My Saturn return, I settled down in New York. And a year went by in the blink of an eye. People always say, oh, time moves so fast these days. Old men say it more. The older we get, time moves faster. Days have less meaning, weeks have less meaning, months have less meaning, years. Go by like $20 bills are spent in New York City. Well, what's the next phase? of speeding up life till its death, till its end. Go to school, get a job, get a routine. Many of you did this many years ago. Nothing in my life is regular. Somebody say, well, what time do you usually eat? What time do you usually go to sleep? I don't usually anything. I don't usually any when. I was thinking earlier today about how I'm actually not the very adventurous. I live in New York City because I'm not very adventurous. I want a known quantity. I want a uh, world that is a size that can be known. New York City has boundaries. And everything outside of it doesn't matter very much. I was thinking living in Europe, in a small town or a small mid-sized city. Old, old, old buildings, everything was known. And maybe that would be really healthy for me to be in a place where everything was known. It's one of the things that makes a lot of Europeans want to run away to America, where you can be free and nothing has a history. Or the history doesn't matter. History feels heavy in Europe to a lot of people. But maybe that'd be really grounding for me. Letting the days go by. Grounded. Heaviness. Known quantities. Boundaries. This is a story about Facebook beard collecting. And I didn't think I was ever going to use it very much. And then it became a way of life. I don't know. I got a lot of people friending me. And people friending me because of my beard. Sex appeal. And somewhere in the Facebook game, I started this idea in my head of, fa of beard collecting. There were also the beards. And I began to notice there were swaths of people that would send me friend requests. And this was in the days before all the sexy robot girls. The beards, the bears, and the beards. And there was just this strata of people who are specifically going for the long beards. I, of course, would see all these people with big beards and be like, well, thank you, Facebook. I don't know him, but I would like to. So I don't think that I've actually met any of the beard collectors. There's a lot of people who send me friend requests just because they have a big beard, and some of them have big beards as well, and, and, and some of them don't. There's some people who just like to collect beards, and they don't have one. Um, 
But there's definitely been beards I've collected of just people that I've been like, oh, he's really beautiful. Look at how long and, you know, silvery or whatever his beard is that I find attractive. Anyway, I think today was the first time I ever met somebody I Facebook beard collected. Sexually objectifying people sometimes results in a very sexy sexual object. This isn't a story I want to tell. But it's been interesting, like the different people I've met, uh, I was trying to be very adamant when I got here that I wasn't going to just be hooking up with people. So anybody who, I was like, I still use Growler and Scruff and stuff, but I was like, yeah, I don't really want to just hook up for sex. I want to meet up and do other things. So there was an interesting amount of people who found me through Facebook who were just like, oh, let's get together. And some people took me out here that I didn't know. It was really fascinating to just spend some time with them. But I'm not, not very good at sitting still when I'm at nude beaches. I just walk around and talk to people. So even with these new people, I was like, oh, it's nice to meet you. And this is great to hang out with you. I'm going to go walk around and eat berries and play with people and pet people and massage people and talk to people and meditate a little so bit. So right now I'm at Rooster Rock, which is a nature preserve. No, state park. State park. It's a state park uh, on the Columbia River. And this is actually a straight behind this island this is sand island behind me and look at how gorgeous it is right so um the sun is beautiful right now and it's like 7 30 i've been here since three i'm walking up and down the trail naked eating lots of blackberries yeah it's my fourth day here at rooster rock um the first week i was here i came to rooster rock every other day which was really nice, and then went to Bagby Hot Springs, then to Brewster Rock, and uh, then I've spent the last three days in the city, although I did get out Monday to go for a hike in the Columbia River Gorge to see some waterfalls, the Multnomah Falls, which are quite famous, but didn't spend much time there. Uh, mostly hiked around the Horsetail Falls and the um, Oneonta Gorge. Didn't get up to the Triple Falls because we were running out of sunlight and we drove along to the Multnomah Falls and saw them in the nighttime, which was very pretty. Um, so I have been doing a good job of getting out of the city. Yesterday, no, two days ago, a friend took me down to Willamette Falls outside of the, town, the city of Oregon City. And um, that was the Niagara of the West that people have had talked about before I came out here and somebody had sent me a Facebook thing and... They were like, oh, there's factory stuff, and they're going to take it down. And I read about it, and it sounded really beautiful. And I went down there, and it was like the ugliest thing possible. Just all the industry around it, it looked so polluted and disgusting and horrible. And it was like a testament to Oregon's industry. And, you know, it's interesting to be out here in the West, because I haven't been here in such a long time that it feels so different than when I lived out here. There was, a, there was an arc of discovery and youth and integration when I came out to the West when I was younger. So it was like driving across the country back and forth that's a real pedantic way to get into the west to see it all roll by you through the windows um but flying here and after not being in the west much for 10 years and the the way i left it um anyway, i don't want to tell all those stories but um what i'm seeing right now is a lot of stark i mean i guess the narratives the permission of the narratives that have been told in america have changed in my version of America, in my reality. Um, I think when I was younger, I was just like, oh, this is kind of stupid, but whatever. And now there's a lot more intelligence. Maybe I'm just older and more exposed to things, but now there's a lot more intelligence and conversation about how we shouldn't have a Columbus Day because, you know, it's just like a day of celebrating a conquistador who committed genocide and land grab and all this, you know, the, it's kind of, you know, there, it's not just the white man's story anymore. Um, so I see a lot of signs around here that are all about Meriwether Lewis and William Clark discovered this and were, you know, really good at claiming the land. And this waterfall that I saw down in uh, Oregon City had a similar story about how they claimed the land. And it was, you know, the, the Native Americans who lived here at the time, you know, believed that it was a blessing given to them by God because then they could have salmon all year. And then you look at it and it's like the most polluted, horrible, disgusting thing. Horrible. I take some pictures. I'll, maybe I'll put it in this video picture right there um or uh i'll definitely post some pictures if i get around to it um so i have been getting out of the city and seeing some nature and i have been spending time in the city in a uh, the 13th floor labeled the 14th because triscodecophobia 
people. Uh, fear, silliness. 13th floor, labeled the 14th floor uh, at a friend's, uh, nice fairy friend's uh, condo. And it's been interesting to be in a condo. It's very different than the Portland that I lived in. I went to my old neighborhood, 25th and Yamhill, very neighborhoody and quiet, or uh, not quiet compared to lots of other neighborhoods in Portland because now it's the Belmont district and all this stuff. But it was just such a nice neighborhood with nice little houses and beautiful trees. And I just remember the springtime there, the street would be carpeted with cherry blossoms and smell like Pez. Um, it was lovely. Every day that I've been there, I've spent the majority of my time walking up and down the beach, swimming back and forth across the channel, walking up and down the beach. Barefoot, of course, getting blackberry thorns on my feet occasionally. There are so many blackberries. I have been eating them and eating them and eating them and eating them and eating them. And eating them eating them and I love them and so I eat too many every day I go there and get a little sick could be uh, that's just kind of the way I deal with most of life there's other things to eat there that I've also been eating a little too much of it doesn't matter um, so this is a an example of a report from Portland it's not it's not really even a part of my 39 project which was about um, talking about my relationship with the f shape of reality, <laughs> uh, which this is only slightly doing. This is more journaling and blogging and blathering. Um, and that's okay. It's okay to make it a little project. And I think th I'm, this year I, I want to do more videoing as opposed to writing. And so this is maybe an exercise in that and other realms. And I'm yeah, my intention is to edit it into a video, which I may do, and you may get to see it if you are in the mood. Um, so I hope you've appreciated the beautiful background and this body that I'm borrowing, this borrowed body, which I've been appreciating. It's, I mean, so many people out here are just like, oh my God, you're so beautiful because I'm like the hippie ideal out here on the West Coast, which has a different cachet than in New York City. Um, but it's been interesting to appreciate the, I guess, sexiness or whatever I am out here. It's been interesting to feel that and appreciate it. It doesn't make me happy. But nothing conditioned can give you lasting happiness. Don't ask it to. Anyway, enough of this. I'll make a little video of just the beautiful environment. And uh, and then I'm going to go. Because my friend that I'm drove me out here with is ready to leave. Bye-bye. So I thought I'd take a moment to end my Portland report. <laughs> uh, I've kind of lost my voice and it's come back. I got really sick from the uh, bad air. From the bad air. But my host has returned and finally we can see Mount Hood again. I don't know if you can see it on here. Eh, you can't see it on here. There you can kind of see it over my left shoulder. The day my host left, Mr. Riversong, um, Mount Hood disappeared behind the haze of the forest fires, and today it came out again for the first time. Um, the last few days I've been sitting inside, mulling over all the photos, making selections, mulling over the video clips, arranging, rearranging, giving up, spending 12 hours looking at Facebook and the internet and researching music and only occasional moments of porn and uh, I don't know three or four hours a day editing the actual projects 
but that's just the way we roll sometimes, so we do what we can. Anyway, I've been spending the last three days mostly sitting inside, feeling sick, and looking at the phone, and looking at the world through the phone. Television man. Um, and this whole thing seems totally fucking silly and absurd and pointless and teenage and desperate and uh, silly, silly, silly. <clears throat> but it's my reality. So here you go. Have a little. Uh, I'm, I, I feel... <laughs> I feel bad for all of us. I have compassion for us. I feel bad and I have compassion for us. Near enemy, far enemy. Uh, a little jargon. Anyway, I, 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 what's going on right now in the world is just sad. And it always has been, and it's always gone on, and right now it's specifically... <sighs> blah, 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 blah. There are endless pages about it right now on Facebook, so if you actually put this on and just left it on in the background or occasionally glanced at it or just like, what the fuck is up with this guy? Um, what about those poor people? What about those poor people? All of the poor people. Um, it's funny. I don't think of myself as being someone who has a solution. Uh, I don't have a solution to the hate. I don't have a solution to the control mongers. I don't have a solution to the pathological liars and all the carnivores and destructors. <laughs> I don't have a solution. So I um, I just do the little, the little bits that I can, uh, which are not, feel like nothing. And they may be nothing. And, and that's all that it is sometimes, to just do the little bits we can that may be nothing and may uh, mark the time and... Uh, you know, part of my impulse is to be lonely. Somebody once called me hardwired for loneliness. And I think about that sometimes because I always have impulses to get away from all of my friends and go be alone. And then I'm lonely. But when I'm lonely, when I'm the loneliest, like in the last three days where I canceled all of my plans and just sat alone and stared at the internet, that's when I do things like this, which I don't know if it's some great amazing art project, but it's certainly gives me time to process 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 and none of this feels perfect but as I've gotten older I'm I care less about getting things perfect and I just do it um, even when it's pointless and not prescient to the contemporary suffering of <laughs> the zeitgeist <laughs> but uh, it's a beautiful day in Portland here in Portland we got cloudy we got cloudy skies that are beautifully dappled. Mount Hood came back out. There's lots of cars zooming around. The world's going on. And uh, I'm moving through it like I always have and always will. Thank you, anyone who, who wants to say you're welcome. Love you. Bye-bye. Two brief stories. The friend I'm staying with, um, when he got home last night, he said, Well, you know, a few years ago I started making a list <clears throat> of all the decisions I had made or occurrences that were turning points in my life that had changed things for the better. And within a short period of time, I had four pages. just went on and on and on. And it took me a long time to even think of, well, what were some of the negative decisions I had made or negative occurrences that had happened that had made a uh, significant impact on my life. And I thought that was a good exercise, you know. But I also was in awe because there are just some people who, I guess they're neurotic. There are some people that are hung up on all the bad things that have ever happened to them. 
pop songs, a catalog of injury. I think of so much of what I see in the world as people focusing on the negativity, and that's just because I focus on the negativity. <laughs> I guess. The other story I wanted to tell was this little idea of the history of Portland, which I don't think I told in all of my rambling stories. My history of Portland, which was that I was really curious about this city because of the movie My Own Private Idaho. So I came here after visiting my friend who was going to school in Salem. Um, I stayed with her for a month, or mostly alone, because she went home to Indiana. And I uh, decided to come up and live here and, you know, had this fascination with prostitution what would that be like? Um, my introduction to the city was pretty shitty in that I, it was cold and wintry and I was sleeping in the back of my truck and I found some place to stay on Craigslist. Um, and I, of course, wanted everything to be cheap back then, so I found a free place to stay where I just had to do work trade and it was a crazy old lady who had an incontinent dog who was pissing and shitting everywhere and she needed a lot of attention. But that's where I met Robert on IRC. That's how I got the name Vine. At that house. A discarded copy of Edith Hamilton's collection of Greek myths made me use the name Anteros online. And I met Robert. I don't remember the name he was using. And he asked my name. And I was being a bitch. And he called me Vine. And I said, what? But looked it up and took it on. I got my first paying massage client here again through chatting with somebody on IRC and he gave massage for a living and he invited me to do a forehand massage with one of his regulars and right before it started he said he might pay you more to finish him off you don't have to do that if you don't want but if you do we'll probably pay you more so the whole time I worked on him I'd brush his thighs and his nipples and see if it would turn him on and I don't know nothing seemed to I, mean, I just wondered why would somebody pay more and what is exactly does that mean to finish him off and uh, Again, I always liked sex, so it wasn't that wasn't a fear for me. It was just confusing why it was commercial, even though I was attracted to the idea through the movies. And um, I held his hand to work on his forearm, and that's when he got hard. And he became a regular client. And he took me to the bathhouse downtown uh, to work on him. I worked on him like twice a week. It took years before I got paid the same amount he paid me. Um, but it was pretty respectful. And when I came back this time, I really wished I could find him. I have no idea how I would find him, so... I didn't even try, because I have no idea how I'd find him. But that I had this um, fantasy Gus Van Sant painted of this filthy... boy's city. And... Uh, it wasn't that. You know, I... I, I I asked people where the streetwalkers were, and they said, oh, that's not the way it is. Everything's done through the computer now. And this was in the late 90s. And I met some guy who was a really sexy bear, um, but he was somehow in mind control of some woman. And, but he was the pimp who ran the boys <laughs> in the city, and he said, you're going to have to cut your hair and your beard and your pubes. And I was like, no, just try to sell me as I am. He got me one client, and it was a nightmare. And I was like, okay. I don't need to do that. Not a problem. And I gave the client that I had to one of the guys at the bathhouse when I started working at the bathhouse. And uh, I thought I had put all that behind me. But it was interesting to come here and see that again and feel that again and remember that. <clears throat> Walk down the streets. Those turning points in our life that changed everything for the better. Can't say for the worst because we're still alive. I guess just to tag on to that story that the I talked with him all day. Not all day. I talked with him for about an hour today about an organization he works with called the uh, Final Exit Network. It's like a euthanasia club. And I just kind of, you know, brought up these ideas of when I was a goth teenager 
I was like, if we're so free, why aren't we free to die if we want to die? Why does it have to be shameful and guilty? And blah, blah, blah. it was really interesting to talk with him about the you know, giving people a dignified way that's not filled with shame or to kill, to not kill themselves, but to just put themselves out of their misery, as you can do to your pets, but not to your parents. Why is that? Um... Anyways, it was just, just an interesting conversation. So anyway, I think of actually, I just like I had to edit the video again. I had I had output it and was going to upload it, but then I had to run and some errands, return the bikes and stuff. And uh, um, I thought I should go and check the volume levels on some of the background recordings, and some of them were too loud. So I'm so I'm going to tag this on at the end. Those little tiny bits of stories because there's always more blathering right always more blathering portland portlando oh portlando oh someone else's portland but i think that's really enough for portland for now for me i'm gonna leave tomorrow and go to brighton bush and uh then on to madras for the eclipse craziness and then um, probably down to California, to Mount Shasta, to visit my friend Lewis and a bunch of aliens and reincarnations of sacred beings. And maybe I'll slip into some other dimensions. I don't know. And um, nature and the beauty and the openness. And then maybe some other people. And then who knows? So okay, enough of the constant blathering. Again, I kind of don't encourage anyone to necessarily watch and or listen to all of this, but some of you, for a few decades now, have found me interesting, so. <laughs> Thank you for your love and attention and witness. <sighs>